also our October sponsor as well. I congratulate Jamie Smith, our Kwanian of the Year. Jamie, any other words uh, following your your award there? I have it. I have it prominently displayed for you all. But no, thank you guys again. I appreciate it. Well deserved. And uh, again, all of our in-person club meetings are uh, going to go virtual through 2020. And then uh, your new president, Eric Steele, will make decisions from there. Uh, we have, I, again, I want to thank you for uh, the camp meeting the Kiwanis legacy campaign goal of 105,000. I think we're up to 107,000 at this point. And um, that's nice. We're showing everybody who is... Um, uh, made a gift there. So again, really appreciate your support uh, here. Uh, you may also consider, uh, you may also consider making a gift to uh, our fund in lieu of our lunches, not having lunches. So again, uh, most appreciative of meeting that campaign goal. And a reminder, next week we have our past President's Day, uh, which will be always fun and that'll be my last program as your uh, president. So I'm gonna check, I don't see coach yet, but if you can bear with me just a minute, if you guys wanna talk amongst yourselves, I'm gonna contact them here and we will get them on. He's saying he can't see us yet, so what's that mean? Hello? Coach? You got me? Yeah, thank you for joining us. No problem. All that. Uh, I'll back it up just Let's see uh, really appreciate you joining us we are we're thrilled to have coach Steve Lavin on the call today and as I mentioned to several people this morning our timing was impeccable uh, we were pretty fortunate we reached out to coach a couple months ago and he graciously agreed to uh, join us and uh, I've been a huge fan of his I'm going to read his bio in a minute here um, but just have followed his career. He's been involved in college basketball for about 30 sure. years now. I'm not sure they have that yet. Had a great You time. guys have me? Yeah. Yep. You do? Okay, good. I just wanted to make sure. Great. Thank you. We got you. And Perfect. if everybody can mute yourselves um, as we start out with coaches' comments here. But been a big fan of his uh, tenure at UCLA at St. John's. We loved watching it at Hinkle. Coach, you got outside the coaching box a few times, but um, – you know, nonetheless, love uh, playing your teams in Hinkle. But I do want to get to reading his bio um, because he's had a very prestigious career here. Uh, former St. John's and UCLA head coach Steve Lavin uh, is now an analyst for Fox Sports' extensive college basketball coverage. Uh, he joined the network prior to the 2015-16 season uh, and serves as a studio analyst. Uh, as I mentioned, he's been associated with college athletics for more than 30 years previously serving as head coach at St. John's and UCLA. Although he began, I believe he began his career at Purdue, and I want to touch on that um, here as we talk, but and as a broadcaster with ESPN and ABC. Uh, at St. John's from 2010 to 2015, he led the Red Storm to 20 or more wins on three occasions and a couple NCAA tournament appearances in 2011 and 2015. So, man. And... Uh, Again, from UCLA, at UCLA from 1996 to 2003, Lavin led the Bruins to six seasons with 21 or more wins and six consecutive NCAA appearances. Uh, in his 11 years as head coach, he led teams to 10 postseason appearances, including eight NCAA tournament uh, bursts, nine seasons of 20 or more wins, and posted a career record of 226 and 131. Uh, between his coaching stints at UCLA, he worked as a Disney Corp at Disney Corporation and, uh, again, as an ESPN, ABC college basketball commentator. Born in San Francisco, and I think that's where he's calling in today from. Is that correct, Coach? Yes, it is. San Francisco. Okay. Um, we'll talk a little bit, too, about his uh, late father, Cap Lavin, who was inducted into the San Francisco Prep Basketball Hall of Fame in 1992. He's got five brothers and sisters. Uh, one of the things I really appreciate Coach Lavin for is he's been involved in a lot of charities. Make-A-Wish, Coaches versus Cancer, City of Hope, and the Jimmy V Foundation. So, Coach, uh, a long bio, but wanted to read that to everybody. And 
I just really want to thank you again for joining us. Um, we agreed. I talked with Coach yesterday. We're going to kind of do this as a – I'm going to moderate a and a with him. I, my Kiwanians know me, Coach, as a basketball junkie, so I've, I've got a lot of questions lined up for you, and then we'll take some questions via chat as well. But I know you're busy, and we've got a basketball-loving audience here in Indiana, and they, they love having you on here. So I'll begin the Q&A. Um, and feel free to take this if there are a couple points you want to interject as well. But first question, non-basketball related, we've seen a lot of the fires on the West Coast. How are, how are things in San Francisco? You know, just the last two days, um, the air qualities uh, improved dramatically, but uh, it was frightening there for uh, really a couple of weeks. Uh, we had a bad, you know, air condition, air quality. Uh, so we stayed indoors. We kind of low-keyed it. Um, obviously, with the pandemic, uh, we're low key in it anyway in terms of adhering to the guidelines and whatnot. But um, this even took it up another notch in, in terms of uh, watching a lot of Netflix and the news and uh, old old game film. Uh, one of the interesting things these last five six months, I've had the chance for the first time uh, in my coaching career or my my professional career for that matter to go back and watch uh, review you know, games from uh, my time at UCLA and uh, at St. John's as well, even some broadcasts. So uh, it's been uh, rather informative and, and a fun experience to uh, do the deep dive. But uh, the air quality is better here and glad to be with you. And I appreciate the uh, really kind uh, introduction as well. You could be my agent uh, if I jump back <laughs> in coaching. That's great. Well, we're going to spend a lot of time talking about the the big announcement yesterday that we're going to have a season, thankfully, and um, kind of about the state of the college game as well. But I, I want to begin by asking you a little bit about your your beginning in coaching and the influence of your dad. And then we do have a lot of Purdue fans uh, on the call. And I know you had time with Coach Katie and you have a lot of respect from, for Coach Katie. I've met him a couple of times, but I always said you guys, you may have had the best and worst hair combination in the history of college basketball. So, yeah, lots um, of very creative. Yeah, a lot of hair product and a, a lot going <laughs> on with Coach Katie as well, obviously. But uh, he simplified things uh, in recent years and uh, has moved away from the uh, the unique uh, hairdo that he had for decades at Purdue. And it's also uh, been something where he saves a lot of money because it was getting to the point where it was a little too costly, especially when he was in New York with us at St. John's. Uh, to get the hair dyed and to, to have that weave, um, you know, <laughs> done twice a month was was just a little too much. Yeah, and I think on a serious note, didn't they detect cancer when they they shaved his head, or maybe um, there there was something there as well? I think there may have been uh, some 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 form of skin skin cancer. So that was a a, a blessing from um, his wife making him cut his hair. So it took a while to get used to, you know, you're just accustomed <laughs> to seeing someone look a certain way. And uh, when he had that kinder, uh, gentler, uh, you know, statesman look, um, it took a couple years. But now uh, I love it. And uh, I'm happy for him. He's living uh, in South Carolina, and he's getting some golf in. He's still active in terms of uh, getting his steps in on the Stairmaster. And he has some friends uh, in that part of the world that uh, he, he spends time with as well. So yeah. uh, it's, it's a nice community he's got. He's a great Facebook follow as well. He, he gives you daily updates on what he's doing. But can you talk about your dad's influence? Um, I'm familiar with your dad. May, there may be people on the call who aren't, but your dad's influence and in why you got into coaching? Yeah, I think uh, my father being an educator, he was an English uh, literature you know, poetry teacher and an author. He, he wrote 17 books on writing and composition. Uh, he taught English at every level, um, high school, uh, you know, in the Bay Area here at Cal Berkeley and San Francisco State and College of Marin and Dominican College. So uh, he was a lifelong educator. Uh, he only coached for two years at Reardon High School in San Francisco and he uh, did well, actually won the city championship here in San Francisco. Uh, but he turned all of his energies to, you know, higher education and uh, his passion, his love uh, for writing. Uh, so even though he 
you know, had a short coaching career. I do think uh, his influence in terms of having a love for the game of basketball. And there were six kids, as you mentioned in our family and four boys and uh, all six kids played basketball. Uh, were you going to say something? No, no, I appreciate oh, that. Okay. Um, yes. Can you talk about so I was just Go going to say, so he, I think his, his love for working with young people and his, um, his gift for, um, you know, helping students and elevating their thinking, uh, as well as their writing and, um, you know, good thinking and good writing. It's kind of like the triple threat, uh, lead to also being able to express yourself, uh, and be more articulate. And so in basketball, the triple threat, right, is to pass, uh, you know, be able to dribble and shoot. And uh, in, in life, I, you know, thinking, uh, being able to put it on paper, uh, kind of the architecture of your thoughts, the words put on paper, and those two combined um, enhance your ability to frame an argument um, or to express yourself, uh, which I think is, is important for young people to possess those skills. And so I think he was such a inspiring teacher uh, that led me to want to do the same thing, but in coaching and be able to uh, put kids on a positive trajectory in terms of their careers and to try and instill the right virtues and values uh, that sport can teach us. Sport in its purest form is a metaphor for life, um, can teach us these kind of really important qualities or traits or attributes that transcend sport. And um, so that's what kind of led to me at a young age, writing letters to coaches. And I wrote letters to Bobby Knight, uh, Gene Cady, Mike Krzyzewski, and Jerry Tarkanian. I was in college at the time, probably a sophomore in college, about 20 years old. And I started pen palling with those coaches. And thankfully they all wrote back. And I was just asking for books to read, clinics I should attend, the steps I should take because I aspired to someday walk in their shoes as a division one coach. And, um, and then I went back and watched them at work firsthand. I spent uh, a month at Indiana, uh, actually was kind of couch surfing uh, with different players. Uh, Cree Smith, who was there at the time, Brian Sloan. There was a, a manager, Craig Hartman, who later became an assistant to Coach Knight. And I was able to sit in on the film sessions with uh, Ron Felling, Tate's Lock, Joby Wright, uh, Coach Knight, Dan Dakich. And then I did the same thing at Purdue. Um, and it was, in my view, kind of the golden years, the Big Ten. You know, Bill Frieder was at Michigan, Lou Henson at Illinois, uh, Clem Haskins at Minnesota, Tom Davis at Iowa, Coach Katie, obviously, at Purdue, Judd Heathcote at Michigan State. Uh, Foster had come over from Duke and was at Northwestern. Uh, so the conference uh, had these great teachers and great mentors. So it was a wonderful time to go in and do a deep dive, um, you know, you know, on college basketball. And yeah. um, then I returned back to school, got my degree. Um, and that summer I went back and worked all the summer camps. And at the end of that summer, uh, Kevin Stallings, one of the assistants at Purdue, moved on to Kansas as an assistant before becoming the head coach at Illinois State and then later Vanderbilt and Pittsburgh. Um, but when he moved on, uh, that opened up a position on the staff. Everyone bumped up. Coach Katie called me in August of 1988 and offered me the position. And it was life-changing. Uh, everything that's happened in my life and career, uh, you know, is a result of Coach Katie opening the door for me and having him as a mentor and really teaching me, um, you know, what the most important elements are, being a head coach, of building a culture and a program. And, and it was nice to bring it full circle. And he was able to join me uh, because he was retired at the time at St. John's when I went back into coaching in 2010 and having him there as our Mr. Miyagi, basketball Buddha, um, our grandfather, the, the chief of our tribe, so to speak, at uh, St. John's was, was really a special time and really as memorable as anything that happened at St. John's uh, was, was the relationship uh, and the time uh, that I was able to spend with Coach Katie. And our players uh, really appreciated him, his sense of humor, uh, his wisdom, and uh, his authenticity, uh, all these uh, wonderful traits that Coach Katie possesses. Yeah, it was weird seeing him in red, though, on the sidelines. <laughs> and uh, maybe maybe part of that hire was you had gotten the intel down in Bloomington. And uh, he, that, that was an aspect that, that he 
that he uh, appreciated. By the way, we have a, a gentleman on the call who's 94 years old and is probably the biggest Purdue fan in the world named Mickey Core. And his high school or his college, no, high school gym teacher just happened to be a guy named John Wooden, who I'll uh, wow. we'll, we'll talk about at the end because I want to ask you about some of your influences. But I do want to dive into the big announcement yesterday, uh, last night, that we are going to have a season. Um, I think we're still parsing out what that'll look like. Um, it's supposedly going to start November 25th, but would, would love your thoughts on that announcement, how you see the season playing out, and um, we'll take it from there. Yeah, it's good news that, you know, we have a date because in terms of planning and logistics, it's um, helpful for you know, everyone involved in college basketball, um, and even from a media perspective, uh, now that I'm in broadcasting, it helps, you know, my bosses begin to calendar um, and give assignments to, you know, both the people that work in studio, as well as uh, on the games, courtside, remote, as we call it. Um, so I still think uh, we're in a place uh, like so much of the world, uh, the altered world that we're in today, uh, where it's going to be fluid and uh, we have to stay nimble. Uh, we're continuing to learn day to day. And that's okay. I think, you know, um, you'd rather have a nimble, flexible approach and be able to make informed and good decisions as we learn more about the virus. Um, we're also learning from uh, the NBA and the success they've had in the bubble uh, in this postseason. And so their expertise uh, will be helpful. And uh, there's that trial and error aspect uh, as we move forward and college athletics will borrow from the NFL and uh, from the NBA uh, as we you know, chart this, this course. And uh, there's a lot of talk about the bubbles and I'm sure uh, basketball fans have seeing the news on, you know, potential sites for the non-conference tournaments that in the past have happened uh, in Maui or Puerto Rico. Uh, but now those will happen here in the States and uh, inside a bubble. And uh, there's just a lot of logistics and things that will have to, uh, you know, be planned, but also be ready for um, scenarios that happen uh, where, adjustment or modifying uh, will be critical. So much like we talk about sport being a metaphor for life and what we want our teams to be able to do in terms of being resilient, uh, being able to adapt and adjust, uh, we now will get to do that ourselves in terms of leadership in college athletics uh, to really keep in mind the well-being and the health of the young people, uh, the student athletes. And if we keep that uh, as the top priority, and we operate in an informed manner, uh, I think we'll get to a good place. And uh, the, the overused term, but uh, the new normal uh, each day uh, presents, you know, uh, a set of challenges or hurdles because uh, we're in just this, uh, this new place in the world. But uh, I think it's really good that the date is established and uh, now people can begin the calendar and plan. And as I mentioned, logistics, um, you know, the wheels start turning. Yeah, you mentioned tournaments moving. I'm not sure how, but I believe the battle for Atlantis, usually played in the Bahamas, is going to be played in South Dakota. So I'm, I'm sure that's a disappointment for those who are planning their, to bring their Bermuda shorts and Hawaiian shirts down to, to the Bahamas. Different. Quite a contrast. And I think yeah. Indianapolis... Indianapolis is a site for some too. It might've been Maui. Uh, there's some discussion of that because Indianapolis obviously is one of the ideal setups uh, when it comes to, you know, uh, tournaments. Uh, we've seen that with the high school tournaments going way back in the day. And then the final fours uh, of course, as well and regionals. And so it's a city um, that has the infrastructure and, and uh, just the convenience in terms of hotels to the arena restaurants, uh, everything within walking distance. Uh, so I think Indianapolis will play a big part. And of course, the NCAA uh, being located there as well uh, plays a part in all of this. Yeah, and we have a similar climate and setting as Maui as well here, um, as, our, <laughs> of course. as our residents know. 
Um, you know, one thing I, I wanted to ask on safety, you know, we focus a lot on the student athletes, which we should, but, you know, we have some of our great coaches in, in this game that are, you know, I think Coach Krzyzewski is 73, Roy Williams is 70, I think Bayheim's 105. Um, you know, we've got some, you know, older coaches that I worry, you know, you worry a little bit about COVID. Do you, do you have a thought on that in terms of safety? Well, you know, they're, they're on college campuses so often there's, uh, you know, uh, hospitals, you know, uh, in town nearby. I, I think they're going to get the best um, consultation. And it, it's really about, you know, being prudent. And college coaches uh, tend to have vitality and energy because it is a 24-7 you know, year round proposition. Um, but I do think being mindful is important and uh, coaches, you know, by nature uh, have to be curious, uh, whether it's in recruiting and getting to know a, a prospect or his, his family um, and uh, what, what a prospect's interests are. And so, you know, being interested in your own health uh, is important at any age. And so I just think uh, coaches across the board because of their stress levels and, um, you know, burning the candle, uh, both ends, so to speak, they have to be very mindful. Um, but um, I don't think it's a scenario where, um, you know, we're going to have to have different hiring practices uh, or coaches are going to step aside. I don't anticipate that. But I do think that um, all coaches as you know, need to be uh, really prudent and, uh, thoughtful and set a good example as well uh, for their players and the entire basketball program in terms of taking uh, COVID-19, this virus seriously um, and not being casual uh, or flippant uh, by any means that, um, you know, it can't happen to them. No doubt. Uh, one to focus on the NCAA tournament, two things. Um, I was in New York. You may have been as well for the Big East tournament with the Butler team last March, and it's kind of surreal. Um, did you have an inclination a couple of days before that it was going to be canceled? And then projecting forward, I, I know it's difficult, but do you see how do you see any changes perhaps with the structure of the tournament this year? Yeah, I had a um, a pretty strong sense that uh, there was the possibility. Let me close this. Um, there was the pretty strong possibility that it could be canceled. Um, we were actually in the West Coast and going to cover the Pac-12 tournament in Las Vegas and actually flew over there, was going to be working with Joe Davis and uh, Casey Jacobson and Kevin Burkhart uh, with our studio and game uh, talent crew. And uh, we got the call. Uh, the day we were traveling over that there was the possibility uh, that the tournaments could be shut down uh, due to the pandemic. And I think right about the day we left, it, it might have been uh, announced that it was officially a pandemic. And up to that point, um, there was some you know, uncertainty. But uh, and we landed in Vegas and uh, the next morning turned around and came right back. Um, you know, Casey, Joe. Uh, and Kevin went back to LA. I came back to San Francisco. And then shortly after uh, the announcements, you know, the NCAA tournament uh, shutting down as well. So um, I did have kind of a heads up uh, from my bosses at Fox who were in communication with uh, all the conference commissioners and the NCAA. Great. I, I want to transition a little bit to the state of the college game. I, I'm a huge fan, have been for a long time. I do worry a little bit about it right now. And there are a couple of topics maybe to just pick your brain about. Um, yep. But the, the transfer epidemic, you know, and mm -hmm. I think there may be a rule coming that allows a one-time exemption where you don't have to sit out a year. The, the, um, the G League is really now providing a, a threat maybe for – for players leaving early in addition to the NBA. Uh, obviously, and I don't, I told you this on the call yesterday, I'm not gonna have you mention specific schools, but the 
you know, it's been a tough time with recruiting, you know, and violations and corruption mm -hmm. in the game. And I still think it's a, a wonderful game, but I just ask you for your opinion on where we're at in, in college basketball. Yeah, I think this past, you know, two years have been tough between the FBI, um, you know, investigation uh, into college recruiting and, uh, you know, the NCAA as a result of the information that was unearthed uh, through that FBI investigation is now doing their due diligence in terms of the respective programs, uh, coaches that were involved in what was unearthed by the FBI. Uh, so it's still to really be determined in terms of what the NCAA is going to do with regard to sanctions, um, you know, on those respective programs. Um, and then the pandemic and shutting down conference tournaments and the NCAA tournament obviously was a setback as well. And then we're in this interesting place uh, with the amateur model, um, you know, being uh, tweaked. And uh, the amateur model, the 1950s or 60s, uh, even the 70s into the 80s, uh, similar to the Olympics, uh, you know, who had to change the amateur model uh, for the U.S. to be competitive and to allow our athletes to compete against the rest of the world. And they adjusted uh, the amateur model uh, with regard to the Olympics. And I think we're trying to take those same steps uh, the NCAA, um, universities, athletic directors, uh, the Coaches Association, the National Association of Coaches. Um, so uh, there's no doubt we're at a, a really interesting, uh, complicated uh, juncture or intersection in the history of college athletics. And um, the name you know, uh, was it name, likeness, brand, I think, something along those lines. But Name, uh, image, likeness. There it is, name, image, likeness. You know, that element also will, will clearly play a part. Uh, I don't think we're at a place where college athletes are going to be paid uh, for their performance on the field. I, I think if we go that route, then it's, it's, it just becomes professional. Uh, there's definitely a business element to college athletics. Uh, that's not a secret. Um, when you're, you know, bringing in billions of dollars uh, in college football and college basketball, uh, there is a currency, a, a business aspect that's in play. Um, and it's very nuanced in terms of how you ret ret retain um, the amateur feel and deliver on, you know, what amateur means in uh, the college environment for a student athlete. Uh, but uh, like anything, you know, if we don't evolve, um, you know, if there's not evolution, uh, eventually there's a revolution. And I'm not uh, saying that what college athletics is going through is anything like civil rights um, or things that have happened around the world in, in our history. Um, but it is, uh, on a smaller scale, a revolution of sorts. And uh, it's because there wasn't the necessary evolution through the decades, and uh, no one could have foreseen uh, when Coach Wooden was playing basketball at Purdue in 1928 to 1932 under Ward Piggy Lambert, or when Tono, Tony Hinkle at Butler was coaching four sports, uh, if not more, um, you know, no one could have foreseen what college football and college basketball has turned into in terms of the popularity worldwide. And uh, the amount of, you know, revenue streams coming from television and advertisers, Madison Avenue, and, and uh, again, the merchandise that, that's uh, being sold and, and being able to watch games on our smartphones and uh, watch live action uh, on our phones as we, uh, you know, on a subway or, or walking down a street. So um, it, it's understandable um, why they're you know, are elements or aspects to college athletics uh, that haven't evolved as quickly as they should have. Uh, but at the same time, I think we need to take responsibility and kind of own it and say, you know what, um, if we had done a little better along the way uh, in evolving and growing and adjusting and adapting to the changing times, uh, then maybe we could have been a little more out in front of this um, than now being in a position where we're getting 
forced uh, into change. Uh, but at the end of it, I think because of leadership, I know in college basketball, Dan Gavitt, who's uh, outstanding as a leader, his father, Dave Gavitt, uh, the great coach at Providence and, and uh, the founding father of the Big East and was an outstanding coach himself at, at Providence, but and a broadcaster. Uh, but his son, Dan Gavitt, is overseen and uh, there was some talk that he might end up leaving to take over the National Association of Basketball Coaches uh, leadership position, but I'm glad the NCAA retained him because this is a nuanced, complicated uh, time in our history when we just look at college basketball, uh, but college athletics in general. Um, college football and college basketball kind of drive things from a revenue standpoint. And um, so... I do think because of our leadership, we'll get to a better place. Uh, there's going to have to be some give and take and some flexibility um, in, uh, in our thinking uh, to get to the place to protect what's wonderful about the game um, and stand strong on that aspect. Certain pieces of the amateur model should remain, but I think we need to tweak it uh, like the Olympics. Uh, the Olympic Committee was able to do uh, decades ago. Appreciate that. I actually saw two days ago there was a potential movement to trim coaches' salaries. We've got coaches making north of six million, and I'm sure that'll go over well with um, <laughs> Coach Calipari and, and Coach Gay. I do want to transition a little bit to some some positives. Uh, and I, I see your. I appreciate you wearing your your Big East jacket there. I got to represent. Know, yeah, you know the the new Big East formed roughly six and a half years ago, and I, I wanted to pull these quotes, but there were a lot of naysayers. You know, that this league's going to be watered down, that you lost Pittsburgh and Syracuse, and uh, not that I'm biased coming to you from the Butler campus, but I, I think the Big East has been the best conference basketball-wise, top to bottom. We've had two. Villanova's won the national title twice. We've had, we've sent five, six different teams to the NCAA. I think we would have sent seven had it not been for COVID. So I want to get your thoughts. You've coached in and now cover the Big East, but I, um, I'd love to get your reflection on, on the conference. Yeah, it's really interesting because I've been fortunate enough uh, during this 32-year association with the game, a, a journey or love affair with the game, uh, was able to coach in the Big Ten in the Midwest and then out West at UCLA in the Pac-10, now Pac-12, and then most recently uh, coach at St. John's in the Big East. So, uh, you know, three different regions of the country, three uh, tremendous conferences, and was also able as a broadcaster, two stints, seven years with ABC ESPN, where we covered every major conference in the country when I was barnstorming uh, with Brent Musburger. Uh, calling the Saturday ABC game of the week when we used to have a game of the week in college basketball. And then on Tuesday, Thursday nights, I'd cover uh, Big Ten basketball as well uh, for ESPN. And then on Wednesday, I was in studio. Uh, so they kept you busy when you're at ESPN. So my perspective was really kind of informed both from, you know, being on staffs and coaching in those conferences, but also stepping back a little bit because as a broadcaster, it's somewhat like a sabbatical you get a wider angle lens and, um, and really helpful uh, experiences because uh, you're learning what you can share with the viewer at home and as a result, have a more informed uh, broadcast uh, to be able to uh, entertain, but also give them analysis and, and perspective. Um, but I'd say the Big East, uh, because of you know, the national championships in recent years, uh, Villanova's had you know, three Final Four runs, but two national championships uh, recently. And uh, Butler's, you know, runs uh, in the tournament. Uh, Creighton uh, has done so well uh, winning the Big East uh, this past year under uh, Coach McDermott, uh, a true gentleman and, and one of the best in the business. And um, you've also had some programs that have come back to life, uh, like Providence, you know, who had struggled for years, but now they're getting the NCAA tournament on a regular basis. Seton Hall, I think, was headed to their fifth straight NCAA tournament um, before the pandemic hit. Um, so the combination of, um, 
you know, the media centers uh, that, you know, the Big East represents, um, kind of the, the geography of the conference is such that there's advantages for recruiting. Um, you know, Butler can recruit on the East Coast if they choose to. You know, Creighton can now recruit uh, on the East Coast uh, because they're aligned uh, in this conference realignment uh, with the Big East. And so they come under that umbrella. Um, so, yeah, I think rivalries, uh, as good as it gets uh, when you look at the history of college basketball uh, in the Big East. Uh, so I'd say the Big East and the Big Ten. Uh, the Big Ten, when you look year after year uh, in terms of attendance, speaks volumes about the passion of fans in the Big Ten. Um, and obviously outstanding coaches. I think this past year they might have been headed to have a 9, 10, you know, NCAA tournament bids coming out of their conference. Uh, my first year in the Big East in 2010-11, uh, we had the record-setting 11 NCAA tournament bids out of the Big East. Now, that, of course, was before the realignment. But uh, to your initial question about my thoughts on the Big East, it's as good as it gets. Um, and I'd say right there is the Big Ten. The challenge uh, with the Big Ten is, you know, we're in this outcome-oriented uh, culture. And uh, since they haven't won a national championship since Tom Izzo's 2000 team, if I'm not mistaken, with the team Cleves and company, uh, they've gone a couple decades now without bringing home a national championship. Um, and again, that just shows how difficult it is to win an NCAA championship. If the Big Ten hasn't been able to do it two decades, uh, you know, it, it speaks volumes about what Villanova has been able to do or going back to Florida when Billy Donovan won back to back. Uh, it's really difficult, and uh, it's not the days of John Wooden where, you know, you win two games and you're in the final four, and if you win four games, uh, you're cutting down the nets. Uh, those two extra games when we expanded the field uh, make a big difference, and, um, and also just the quality of play throughout the world uh, is at a higher level. That's why we have so many Europeans, people from overseas coming uh, and getting drafted in the NBA and really being franchise changing players in the NBA. And that speaks to the popularity of college bas basketball period. And, and it's affected college basketball, but, uh, but Big East, as you can see, I'm representing and, um, and the big 10 are probably right now, the top two, nothing against Kentucky and the Southeastern conference. And it's cyclical. I mean, the, the, the PAC 12 has been getting beat up in football and basketball because there's kind of a perfect storm that aligns and it's going to eventually happen to everyone. No one gets out unscathed. Uh, you know, at some point, uh, Duke, you know, had tough stretches where they didn't make the NCAA tournament, right? There's, there's really North Carolina uh, went through it. You know, everyone goes through a down tick, uh, just again, back to uh, emblematic of life itself, right? Not every day can we have a great day. We can strive for a great day every day, uh, but the reality is, uh, no matter what industry, what craft, uh, what aspect, what part of life uh, you work in, uh, you're going to have tough days. You're going to have down ticks. But the important thing is all the fundamentals are there uh, for these, these, these leagues and for college basketball, if we make it a bigger picture, uh, to always be able to return and uh, resurrect itself if it does go through a difficult stretch. Appreciate that. And speaking of rivals, Coach, uh, I appreciate it. You didn't mention Xavier when you were singing the Big East praises. Um, they've, I do, they've done pretty well, too. <laughs> maybe a quick follow-up, quick answer here. I, one of the reasons I love the Big East is you have 10 teams. Uh, you know, they mainly basketball leads. A lot of them don't have football. They're all great schools, save Xavier. Um, do you see any... Um, possibility of expansion for the Big East? Again, I, I love the number 10, but I'm, I'm curious about your thoughts about expansion. Yeah, well, I think Connecticut's going to help because That's they have tradition. Um, they were part of, you know, our original uh, Big East. And um, some of the rivalry games uh, with, you know, Connecticut coming back in, um, I think will help the overall you know, profile of the conference. And uh, Danny Hurley's a good coach. I think that's important, too, when you look at, you know, leadership in athletic directors, uh, school presidents, and the head coaches. And the Big East is really strong. And they're also unified. Um, I think that's 
something the Big East has had because it goes back to Dave Gavitt. You know, he created a culture because he was a coach himself. And so when he established the Big East, uh, there was strategic thinking. Uh, he was a visionary, uh, someone that could pull from the past, uh, but also bridge it to the present and most importantly, position a league for the future. And no one, um, you know, more than, than Dave Gabb was able to do that. And I'd have to add Jim Delaney. I'd say Jim Delaney uh, and Dave Gabb are probably two of the, the best uh, when it comes to leadership within their conferences. And, uh, you know, obviously uh, Jim Delaney now is, is retired or will probably be consulting in, in different roles, but he was also brilliant in terms of leadership. And um, I do think uh, there's the possibility of another school joining. At what point, I don't know, but uh, to make it an even 12, um, I could see some value in that. And um, don't want to speculate on it because it's just really rumors and people throwing names out there. Uh, Connecticut made sense. Uh, it was kind of bantered about. And you heard rumblings uh, related to it, you know, being a, I'll throw one name out. Boston College was, was another school that because they were also in the Big East in the past and uh, a great city uh, in terms of you look at it from a recruiting standpoint and media standpoint. So, um, but again, it's complicated with football and, you know, do, you know, going, do you go back to being an independent um, in football, but then align yourself with the Big East and basketball uh, logistics and, and whatnot have to be worked out. Uh, and those are complicated, but, but I think one more team, I don't see uh, three, four, or five teams join the Big East. Appreciate that. I'm going to ask one more question, and then we'll, we've got a lot of questions in the chat I want to get to. And again, this question comes from a uh, high position of bias. But, you know, when you think about the, the challenges right now in the college game with everything going on, and particularly the possibility of more players leaving early, the one-and-done rule changing where you may not have a lot of the top players ever playing college ball. Um, I, I like to think Butler, you know, we've done things the right way. And there are other schools like us in terms of Gonzaga, other Cinderella's, VCU, George Mason, Loyal of Chicago. What do you see the future for, for schools? You know, we, we don't rely on the, the one and dones. Do you, do you think our future is going to be brighter given the changes or do you think it's going to be more of a struggle? No, I think it's, um, you know, steady as she goes. It's a, a good place to be when you're not reliant um, on the one and dones. I, I think ideally, I know in my experience when I coached um, at UCLA uh, and St. John's, you know, you strived for a mix. I call it the tortoise and the hares that, you know, when you're at UCLA and you're expected to win a national title every year, and in my case, you know, you go to five Sweet 16s and Elite Eight in your first six seasons, you get fired after your first losing season. Um, you know, there's not going to be a lot of patience with bringing in a group of high school kids uh, that are going to develop over four or five years. And in their junior, senior year, maybe you break through in the NCAA tournament, get to a Sweet 16, I hope to go all the way and make it to a Final Four if you can keep that group together and continue to recruit behind it. Um, so, you know, really depending where you are, uh, UCLA was unique, Kentucky's unique, North Carolina, uh, those coaches in the past, you know, you needed to try and get the top player, uh, you know, a Glenn Robinson level player, um, a franchise program changing player. Um, and now um, I think, you know, it's been proven uh, that mixing and matching, um, you know, using the transfer portal, uh, high school kids that develop over time, uh, sprinkle in a junior college player, uh, someone from overseas. Um, and you may along the line have a player that goes out after a sophomore junior year if you have great success, and that's a good problem to have. Uh, but I think balance, very similar to a portfolio, right? Uh, it's a financial advisor, right? You, you always want to have that balance so you're protected uh, as the various markets change. And I think when you look at personnel on a roster, 
Um, you want balance in terms of your classes. Um, you know, ideally, if you can have, you know, if, you know, four or five upperclassmen, right? Four or five underclassmen. And uh, maybe you have a couple scholarships uh, available so you can use them uh, kind of like aces if someone transfers, um, you know, between semesters or a player from overseas uh, wants to come mid, mid year. So I like to always have one or two aces scholarships available um, in the event that someone wanted to transfer in. Now UCLA didn't take transfers uh, very often, but at St. John's we could, we could get a transfer on occasion. So I think Butler's approach, which is uh, developing their players from year to year and having continuity, um, that leads to a culture because now those student athletes that have been to your program three, four years, if they redshirt, you know, even a fifth year, um, they can help those underclassmen by taking them under their wing and helping them prepare for the rigors of the Big East and uh, for life at Butler and for understanding what this coaching staff at Butler wants. So they're almost an extension of the coaching staff by the time they get to their junior and senior year. And they can even in huddles um, have a voice uh, because uh, they're part of it and they participate, uh, participate. And that's one of the brilliant things that Coach Collier has done, um, very similar to a Dave Gavitt. You know, he can draw on those experiences of coach himself uh, as an assistant at Stanford and other stops. And, of course, the head coaching stops at Butler in Nebraska. And then also see it through an athletic director's lens. And uh, now we're fortunate to have him on the selection committee uh, leading the charge, uh, if I'm not mistaken, with the uh, selection committee. So, um, but one of the brilliant things he did because of that informed perspective is, you know, he's made hires, good hires, um, but they're coaches that understand the Butler way. They understand the culture. They understand the history. They know what a Tony Hinkle is and, you know, who he, who he was and what he represents. And um, so, you know, the difficult thing is, of course, holding on to him because Coach Collier, you know, has picked such superstars in the business. They've moved on or because of the platform um, that Butler now is. Um, it's, it's been a situation where Todd Licklider can move on to an Iowa. It didn't work out for him, but that was a great opportunity. And you have to be happy if your people are able to move on. Thad Mata moving on uh, to Xavier. Um, so um, I think it's just a, a, a good situation that Butler has. They've got great leadership from the president, you know, the athletic director, and, and uh, Laval is, is an outstanding coach as well. So um, they're in good shape. Thank you. Uh, Thad's become a good friend, and we still haven't forgiven him. Uh, for leaving Butler for Xavier. Um, that'll be my last Xavier joke. <laughs> Coach, can we, um, can we move to a lightning round? Um, I, I want to try to get through sure. all these questions, maybe Absolutely. short answers here. But uh, first yeah. question, what is the significance of the decision yesterday on, on high school play, on high school uh, basketball here? Well, let's get, get some, uh, specific on it. Uh, Let's see. I didn't ask that question, so okay. I'll ask my friend Gordon to okay. ask it again while I move we'll to the next. Back. Yeah, we'll circle back. Uh, how does basketball foster positive relationships among young people? Do you have any transformational stories? Boy, that is a tough one to answer um, briefly, but no doubt, um, you know, when I look back um, on my career, both as a player, uh, I was fortunate in high school to play on an outstanding team. I was a very average division two level prospect, but our high school team was remarkable. Um, had a great coach named Pete Hayward and uh, we were 65 and one. We had one loss in two years. We won 56 straight games. Uh, so we were 31 and one my junior year and 34 and oh my senior year and uh, playing good competition in Northern California, you know, schools uh, from the East Bay, uh, and, uh, and San Francisco as well. And we had seven uh, scholarship players. Steve Kellenbort went on to Santa Clara, Chris Fulton went on to Utah, Dan Hunt went to Portland. Uh, so it was um, an outstanding team. And those relationships uh, with my high school coach, with those players, uh, they're special. And then uh, my first recruit was Rico Hines. Um, 
who later came with me to St. John's. Um, and uh, he was my first recruit. He was my first hire at St. John's. And, and now he's pretty much the number one player development coach in the NBA. He's with the Sacramento Kings during the seasons, off seasons. He works with all the players. Um, and so just seeing that, you start recruiting a young person 16 years old. And my UCLA kids are now in their uh, early to mid 40s. Um, so it's kind of like that first marriage and your children. And then you'll see these second marriages. And that would be St. John's, um, the second marriage as a head coach of St. John's. And those players are now late 20s to mid 20s. So I've got this interesting mix of UCLA kids in their 40s and uh, my St. John's kids in their 20s. And they both uh, inform me because it uh, keeps me, you know, younger and uh, kind of up to date on simple things like how to navigate Instagram, uh, how to work social media. Uh, because when you recruit today, uh, different than UCLA, where you went in the home and you had conversations and you actually had telephone conversations. Now everything is done uh, through the apps and through DMs and uh, more unofficial visits and whatnot. So the camaraderie with your coaching staffs and your players and the players' relationships with one another, uh, not always. You know, there's sometimes you have players uh, you don't like. You know, as Coach Wood used to say, I loved all my players. I didn't necessarily like them all, but I loved them. Uh, and just like parenting, you know, they're some kids are a little more pleasant to raise than others. Some are more challenging uh, than other children. Uh, and it's the same in any aspect of life. But, uh, but yes, camaraderie, relationships, I think are fostered in an ideal manner when it comes to team sports, because the common goals uh, that you have, that you're striving for as a group, and, um, and then also these virtues and values uh, that we've hit on a couple times today in this conversation, they're so important that we can learn through sport, uh, how to be, you know, humble in victory, not get too big for your britches. Butler does a great job of this. They stay very humble. Uh, even when they're on a roll and they're the hottest team in college basketball, they don't get carried away with themselves. They're not in the peaks or valleys, uh, but also being gracious in defeat, you know, giving a good handshake after someone took it to you, brought you to the woodshed and you need to be able to shake them in the hand and, and uh, congratulate them and then get ready next time you face them, be motivated, inspired to take them to the woodshed. And, that, and that's a good, healthy, competitive attitude. But the humility uh, in victory and the graciousness in defeat may be as important a lesson as any when it comes to team sports. Great. We are running close to one o'clock, um, but I may try to squeeze one or two more questions in. And I'm good on this end, so it's really just your guys on that end if they got to go back to work. But I'm okay, good. well, we may keep you a little after one here so I can get through I'm the fine. questions. So the high school yeah. question was, um, do you think the high school game will mimic the college decision yesterday in terms of the timeline of their season? Interesting. I don't necessarily think so. I, you know, I know in the Bay Area there was some talk, and again, it changes every week, but that they were going to start their, you know, high school seasons, at least in one part of the Bay Area, the East Bay, uh, in January. They're going to kind of back up the basketball season in January. So I think, you know, each high school federation, uh, you know, similar to the challenge at times with our country, right, because of all the different governors and their choices uh, with good intentions. Uh, but when there's not the uniformity, uh, then it can lead to some ambiguity and confusion. And um, there's no easy answer for it when it comes to our country, because that's the way it's set up in terms of our government um, with the governors of each state being able to make decisions, you know, on a more local statewide level. And I think it'll be similar with the high school federations in terms of when they start based on where they're located in the country and based on how the pandemic plays a part. If it's a hot spot, you know, probably less likely to start the season, uh, you know, as usual, they may have to wait. And uh, there may be even some that have to miss an entire season. And it'll be interesting to see if they use the logistics of the bubbles. Um, uh, it, it is obviously <laughs> a really uh, difficult, complicated uh, situation as you go all the way down the line to youth sports and the liability piece uh, that's in play here uh, as well. Great. Uh, this is a really good question. Comparing your stress level uh, from being a coach to now as a broadcaster, I think it was Dick Vitale who said he'd been undefeated for the last 40 years as a broadcaster. 
Can you comment on the difference in stress level and maybe quality of life? Yeah, there's no doubt that um, there are aspects of coaching that I miss. And um, I consider, you know, a return to the sidelines uh, for another tour of duty, uh, if it was a good fit. At the same time, uh, I really enjoy television. And you do have a better quality of life. There's more balance, uh, such an important word. Coach Wooden felt the two most important words in life were love and balance. I'll let that one marinate with you. Uh, but love and balance, two most important words in life. And in basketball, quickness and balance. And in basketball, he means, you know, floor balance. I mean, you know, d defensive balance, offensive balance in terms of your spacing and uh, balance in terms of a jump stop and, you know, head uh, in the midpoint between your two legs with your back straight, like you're, you know, sitting in a chair. But, but also balance of, you know, emotions and uh, exhibiting temperance. But uh, there is more balance, using that word that Coach Wooden thought was so important in life, along with love. And, um, and the, the pace and the tempo uh, is so different. In coaching, now, of course, I picked some unique places. I mean, UCLA uh, in Los Angeles and St. John's in New York, the two, you know, uh, media centers of the universe and um, programs that had great tradition and heritage and uh, high expectations. So um, you were, you know, analyzed, uh, criticized, uh, poked, uh, probed, and, and uh, poked uh, like a frog in a biology class. Um, but I learned from each stop and each experience. So um, I do really appreciate the balance, the tempo, the pace of broadcasting, and I enjoy the work of, you know, uh, sharing a perspective uh, during a broadcast or when I'm in studio, uh, but I'd go back to coaching if, if it was the right fit. And if not, this is my last run and I continue my relationship and association with the game as a broadcaster. I'm grateful and thankful. And uh, this has exceeded my wildest dreams. I came from a town of 2,500 people, the population in Northern California is 2,500. And when I graduating, when I graduated from Chapman University, enrollment was 2,500. So to thought I'd have the opportunity to coach at Purdue and UCLA, work at ABC, ESPN, Big East, St. John's, and now Fox and uh, Turner, CBS. I mean, it's, it's one of those Bob Barker, Price is Right. I'd take it right now um, in terms of the arc of the career and the joy and uh, the relationships. Um, I've been fired twice, um, but I, even there, those inform you know, uh, losing your loved ones, uh, cancer, uh, missed a season with cancer, and uh, losing my mother and father. Those inform, those are very powerful, informative experiences. And that's the buzzword of the day, inform and informative. <laughs> Appreciate that. We've just got a couple left for you. Um, All right. You, you answered this question in your last, uh, in the last question, but our 94-year-old guest, asked about the lessons from Coach Wooden that I think you addressed. Uh, interestingly, talking about coaching again, it says, Coach Lavin, we have an opening here in Indianapolis for a head coach of the Pacers. Would you ever consider a head coaching role in the NBA? You know, it's, it's interesting. I, um, you never say never, right? The Sean Connery, uh, 007. Um, but um, the dilemma he faced when he kept coming back to make another 007 movie. He was my favorite Bond, by the way. Nothing wrong with Roger Moore, some of the more contemporary James Bonds, but I'll take, uh, I'll take the guy from Scotland, uh, Sean Connery. So, um, you know, early in my career at UCLA, you, you go to an Elite Eight, go to Sweet 16, you're, you're um, a hot commodity. There was an opportunity uh, with the Clippers, uh, conversations with the Detroit Pistons. Um, but at that time, you know, I really uh, was enjoying my work. I'd been at UCLA for five years as an assistant and enjoyed the relationship with Coach Wooden. Uh, that's really was the key element to me getting the job first on an interim basis, then on a permanent basis was, was because of my relationship with John Wooden because I'd met him at Purdue and uh, he would come back and I was assigned to making sure he got where he needed to go in terms of signing books, you know, um, at a local bookstore or getting to practice or whatever the event was when we were honoring Coach Wood, which we did frequently. Uh, and that relationship, interestingly, uh, was the key to 
having the interim tag lifted and becoming the permanent coach for seven years at UCLA. So you just never know when you, you meet someone in the cornfields of West Lafayette uh, because Coach Katie gave me an opportunity and that leads to being the head coach of the Bruins. Um, but Coach Wooden, there, there, there were so many aspects and elements I love about him. But back to the Pacers, um, you know, management would interest me. You know, if, if there was the right person, some of my kids are now in the NBA. Uh, Bob Myers is with the Golden State Warriors. He's the general manager, president of the Warriors. He was on my teams at UCLA. Uh, proud of him, what they've done. He was a former agent. Um, you know, down the line, I'm not that old yet, uh, but being in that advisory role like Coach Katie was for me, uh, something like that would intrigue. But I think I've got one more run in me as uh, a head coach. John Wooden won his first NCAA championship at 53 years old. Pretty interesting. He didn't, he didn't knock it out of the park in his 20s, 30s, or 40s. It was 53 to 65. Ten championships in 12 years, seven in a row, 88 straight wins, four undefeated seasons. But um, up to the time he was 53, very mediocre. Pete Newell was dominating basketball on the West Coast, and Phil Wolpert was dominating basketball at USF with Casey Jones and Bill Russell. But Wood was taking notes. He was a learner, an eternal learner. And as he said to me once with a twinkle in his eye, as only Coach Wooden can, with the wry sense of humor, the deadpan expression, he said, Steve, I was a very slow learner, a slow learner. But once I figured it out, I was pretty good. And it was like all say, you know, took him until he was 53, but then he never looked back uh, from that point on. So that's an important element and lesson for all of us to remember, that uh, being an eternal learner, taking notes, getting better, learning when you get taken to the woodshed, uh, learning from being fired, uh, learning from struggles and adversity. And uh, we tend to learn more through the struggles and the adversity than we do through the success. And uh, that's just kind of a universal in life. Our last question, we're going to have a live one um, because he, he wants to mention an interaction he's had with you and I'm going to ask him to keep it brief because I, I listen to his radio show and he can ramble. I can, I can tell him, I can say that because he's a friend, but Mitch Hink, do you want to ask the last question here on the call? Hey coach, it's Mitch Hink. I was the auctioneer at the Coaches versus Cancer Dinner when you were the guest speaker at the Cole Center. That's right. We talked to the bar a long time afterwards, and I said, hey, St. John's would be a good job for you, and you said, good call. <laughs> That's right. That's true. I did and have an interest in that. Con in the news conference, I kept looking for credit, but there was nothing. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, I was a little overwhelmed. I think the big city got to me, you know, being in New York was a little too much. But uh, that's a great story, a good memory as well. And you still got the great voice, that uh, wonderful uh, kind of gravelly, well-lived uh, voice. <laughs> gravitas, <laughs> too. Jones, like Sean Connery, yeah. <laughs> that's it, yeah. A lot of, and there's some gravitas as well as the gravelly. Good to talk to you, Coach. Good to talk to you. Well, Coach, I, I can't thank you enough, especially for staying on a few minutes after. I reached out to you a couple months ago and thought I had no shot, and you replied, and I know our audience is grateful. So a, a, round, a virtual round of applause from our, our audience today. And um, I also want to thank you. you. You do such a great job as a broadcaster and representing the Big East, and uh, we're, we're lucky to have you. And um, in your honor, and we usually make this in our guest speaker's honor, but we're going to make it in your dad's honor, because I know he had a great, um, he had such a great influence on young people as we're making a donation. I'll read it here. An appreciation of the time spent sharing with members of the Qantas Club of Indianapolis, a donation will be made in honor of Cap Lavin to Big Brothers, Big Sisters of uh, of Indianapolis. So uh, coach, again, I, I can't thank you enough for your time today. Well, thank you. Uh, as you know, I've got so much love for the Big East, uh, for Butler, uh, for Coach Collier, the respect I have for him, uh, and you as well, uh, getting to know you uh, over the past couple years. And uh, the Kiwanis Club, just in terms of, you know, supporting uh, youth and helping young people and, again, trying to put them uh, on a positive trajectory and, and the Kiwanis Club trying to make a difference in young people's lives. Uh, that's really special. And uh, so you and the people on the call today and the, and the club, even those that weren't able to join today, 
uh, are to be commended because you're setting a great example for others uh, by getting involved in a charitable way. And I think it was Winston Churchill that said, a, a life uh, without giving is a life not worth living. And um, so I'll leave you uh, with that nugget. How's that? Coach, you are awesome. Thank you. We can't wait to have you back in Hinkle Field House uh, sooner than later. And I uh, wish you all the best. Look forward to it. Stay safe out there. Take care. Bye-bye. Okay. And if our Kiwanians, if you want to stick around for a minute or two just to socialize and reflect, uh, you can. Any thoughts on uh, the program today?